Andrew Charlton, your new quarterly essay is called Man-Made World and it's about choosing between progress and the planet or the choice between reducing poverty and saving the environment. Do we have to choose? I, I don't think we can choose. No. We face two huge global challenges right now. One of them is eliminating poverty in the developing countries and the other is managing climate change. And the point I make in the essay is we have to deal with these challenges together. We can't solve climate change unless we assist the developing countries to develop in a way that's consistent with a, a cleaner energy future. And, and we can't allow the developing countries and in fact the rich countries to continue developing in a way that is inconsistent with the health of the planet. So these are two challenges that we have to deal with simultaneously. You start off the essay talking about the Copenhagen climate negotiations, which are often seen as a sort of watershed moment in, in terms of coordinating global efforts to fight climate change. Mm. Uh, you were there. What did you take away from, from Copenhagen? Well, it was a, um, it was a moment of realisation that after 20 years of global negotiations on climate change, in, in many ways we'd run into the sand. And the reason why we'd run into the sand is because a huge schism had emerged on the one hand between the rich countries and the poor countries. And the rich countries have their proposals to deal with climate change, which are many, but principally a binding treaty to reduce emissions and a scheme to raise the price of fossil fuels. And suddenly across the table at Copenhagen, the poor countries said, those solutions don't work for us. We we have, you know, we're home to six billion people who live in different levels of poverty. Two billion of those live in extreme poverty on less than $2 a day. And you can't ask those people to have more expensive fuel. 20% of the world's population is not connected to the electricity grid. There's no possibility that those people can reduce their energy use uh, or pay more for fuel. You know, they need cheaper and more abundant energy not more expensive and less energy. And this, this schism between these two great global challenges of development and climate change suddenly emerged at Copenhagen in a way that it never had before. It had always been there, but it suddenly emerged uh, as a real deal breaker. And I think that, I think that our, our policy frameworks are still trying to catch up with that challenge. And what do you think should be the role of emissions trading schemes uh, uh, are we barking up the wrong tree trying to reach a, a structure that works for everyone? Look, I think different policies will work for different countries. Uh, you know, Australia is the kind of country that can take an emissions trading scheme and an emissions trading scheme will deliver a number of benefits to Australia. You know, we, we will achieve significant gains in energy efficiency at the kind of carbon price we're talking about. Uh, we will get a, a nudge towards some of the near commercial, cleaner energy technologies, probably like gas. Um, but we have to be realistic about what an emissions trading scheme can achieve in rich countries. Uh, you know, uh, at the kind of prices we're contemplating, they will not make things like wind and solar commercial. The price would need to be many multiples of the current price to achieve that. Uh, but they have their place in rich countries. But you know, the, the, the real consideration is we need a global solution to climate change. And any scheme that involves raising the cost of fossil fuels is not going to work for the poor countries. You know, a significant increase in the cost of fossil fuels is unacceptable to countries where they have hundreds of millions of people living in poverty without enough access to energy, without enough access to cheap energy. So these, these policies simply don't fly in poor countries and without poor countries, we can't solve the problem of climate change because poor countries, you know, nine of the top 10 fastest growing emitters are poor countries. You know, about you know, between 70 and 80% of emissions growth over the next 15 years will come from the poorer countries. So we need solutions to global climate change that work in those countries. And my fear is that policies that require a significant increase in the cost of fossil fuels are not gonna work in those countries. So is the solution that, that we pursue renewable technologies and, and that's, that, that these need to be developed in the Western countries so that they can uh, be applied in, in developing countries? Is, I, I guess it's very difficult to contemplate answers to this conundrum 
in developing countries if we really don't have technologies at this stage? I mean, it seems from the logic of what you're saying is that there really is no solution if we're to allow developing nations to continue to develop. The, the first thing to say is that any solution to climate change that doesn't accommodate the development and the emergence from poverty of the poor countries is a non-starter. It's, it's unjust. In terms of a, a global binding agreement. Yeah, it's, 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 it's manifestly unjust and it will be rejected by the poor countries. So uh, any, any solution to climate change that says you guys can't develop because the environment can't take it is never going to fly. So we can put those solutions uh, off the table. Secondly, uh, any solution to development that requires bringing the six billion people on our planet who live in poorer countries up to the level of living standards that we currently live at now in the rich countries is unsustainable for our planet. Our population is already going to rise from seven billion today to nine and a half billion by mid-century. And to accommodate that 30% increase in the world's population, plus a huge lift in the consumption and living standards of the poorer people, obviously our resources, energy use can't sustain that. So you know, we, we need solutions that deal with both of these problems simultaneously. And the kind of solution space that is possible is significant improvements in technology. It's not easy to do that. Uh, you, know, it's, you can't guarantee that, uh, the, the, that the enormous amount of effort that I'm proposing that we put into new technologies is going to deliver payoffs rapidly, but that is the solution space. And you can only bring developing countries along on the global challenge to defeat climate change if you say to them, we're developing the technologies that will give you energy that enables your people to emerge from poverty and at the same time is clean energy and deals with the climate problem. Arguably, environmental groups have been saying that we need to develop renewable technologies for a long time, and yep. they would possibly say that governments have not really been paying enough attention or not investing enough. Mm. Do, is this, uh, is this a, a sentiment that you sort of agree with? Y yeah, it certainly is. I mean, cl you know, clearly we need a much bigger push on renewables, and we need a much bigger push on, uh, on energy technology. Uh, you know, in, in the essay, I guess some of the differences that I have with, um, with, the, uh, with some green groups is I think we need all the answers on the table, not just a few answers. Um, and, and I talk in the, in the essay about how challenging it will be to try and deal with this global problem just with renewables alone. In fact, I make the case that it will be impossible to meet our targets just focusing on renewables. For mathematical reasons. The sheer scale of the challenge is 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 physically near unachievable with just renewable energies at our current technologies levels. So you know, I, I think it's obvious from the scale of the challenge that we're also going to need clean coal, albeit you know, you have to, we have to take the criticism that clean coal has had a lot of failures and success is certainly not around the corner, but clean coal, given that new power installation at the moment, uh, is still coming 50% from new coal generation that's being installed. You know, unless we have a solution to take some of that carbon out of the atmosphere that's coming out of these coal stations, it's going to be very difficult to achieve our targets. Nuclear is going to be another part of the answer in some parts of the world, not necessarily in Australia, which is a bit of a special case. Uh, renewables and new technologies. So you know, we, we, need a, we need a push across the entire spectrum of clean energy technologies. On the issue of clean coal, Guy Pearce uh, would, would say that all of the experiments on clean coal have demonstrated that it's a pipe dream even more so than solar or, or geothermal or, or other technologies. Yep. Uh, there's absolutely no evidence. It's almost a matter of faith that clean coal might in future work, isn't it? It's, look, it certainly is, yeah. And, you know, I, I, would, I would have to admit that all of the, uh, a number of the attempts that we've had to, to find different avenues for clean coal, which you know, primarily is carbon capture and storage, you know, taking carbon out of coal-fired generators and pumping it underground, um, that those have been really unsuccessful so far. There's no question about that. It's an extremely difficult challenge, and I don't think anyone can pretend to have the answers. But the, the reality of the situation is this. 
a huge part of our global energy infrastructure is coal-fired power stations. At the moment, we're still building coal-fired power stations at a very rapid rate, such that half of all new installed power generation today is coal. Yeah. So unless you deal with the coal problem, it's going to be extremely difficult to meet our targets. And it's not going to be easy to, to find a, a solution to, uh, to find a clean coal solution, but the International Energy Agency, which has done a lot of work on this, makes the point very starkly. If you don't have a clean coal solution, the cost of dealing with climate change increases by 70%. So it becomes much more difficult to deal with the climate change problem if you don't have a clean coal solution. So I would completely agree with all the critics of clean coal, but unfortunately this is not something where we can go, it's not working, let's leave it. We need to push on clean coal as well as other things. And, and that's not to say, that's not to say that we should we should use the hope of clean coal to ignore renewables and all the other technologies. We need to push on those things as well. Putting up clean coal as a possibility is also, uh, it's often used uh, as an excuse to continue to use coal. That's right, but I guess the argument I'd make to you is that in a lot of these poor countries, you know, in South Africa, which is just building the, the, one yeah. of the world's largest yeah, coal-powered they stations, they're going to do that anyway for development reasons. You know? yeah. Even if they didn't have the hope of clean coal out there in the future, that's the thing they're, you know, they're going to be investing in coal because it keeps the lights on yeah. and it delivers power to a lot of very poor people. Look, Guy, Guy Pearce would argue that even if we did have the technology for, for clean coal, even if it did become available and commercially viable, the cost and the infrastructure required to retrofit all of these coal plants would make it absolutely as, as unlikely and impossible as, as any other sort of renewable solutions in terms of just the sheer physical uh, effort and cost required. It seems to me that the, it possibly that the idea of uh, cutting our emissions while continuing to, to expect to power the entire world is, is almost, it's almost an impossible task. It's, it's, a very, it's a very significant challenge. But you know, j just to go back to the point, you know, the, the point you make is a good one. And you know, at, at no stage, I think, is, is, is any serious person saying that clean coal is going to be easy. It's going to be a massive technological and massive engineering challenge. Uh, and, uh, and a very expensive uh, solution in, uh, indeed. However, you know, the alternative to clean coal is, I think, even harder to contemplate. And that is telling poor countries they have to shut down massive investments in coal generating facilities. Uh, I just I think that's, a, that's an extremely difficult message to, to give to poor countries and it's clearly not working right now. Yeah. Right? So it's certainly a huge challenge, there's no question about that, but I think, I think the alternative is even worse. And I think we, you know, we, need to, we need to push on that effort to try and get a result. I'd like to talk about some of the other elements in your essay that you talk about, uh, the idea of limits to other resources. Could you run us through your thoughts on how a growing population is supposed to, to cater for the growing needs in developing countries? Sure. The second thing that, that the essay deals with is some of the challenges we faced in the past, uh, which were also very significant economic and environmental challenges and how we dealt with those to get where we are now. Um, and I, I, I bring out the example of, um, of the predictions in the year 1800 that the world would never be able to support uh, more people than there were alive at that point, which was about a billion people. Uh, they believed that there was a, a finite amount of land, a finite amount of agricultural production and finite resources. Uh, and yet today, some 200 years later, we have seven times that many people on the planet and those people are on average 50 times richer. So you know, humanity has achieved extraordinary progress beyond the wildest dreams of generations that have gone before us. And the, and the essence of that success, one of the essences of that success, has been the compounding impact of technological change, which has delivered, and I talk about this in the essay, huge gains in agricultural production huge gains in uh, new materials um, for, for various applications. And that process of technological advancement, which has been such a, 
such a, a huge benefactor to the generations before us is the same solution space that we need to look to for our future challenges. So uh, the, the story of resource use and, um, and in the essay I, I, I talk about the, um, the many predictions over the last 200 years that the world was going to run out of, of resources. Uh, the, the story of resource use is, I think, a, a good lesson for us as to how previous generations overcame that and what tools they applied and the results that they were able to achieve. So Paul Ehrlich uh, was a, a theorist who, who said that the resources would run out by, uh, I've, I've forgotten what the date, what the, the year was that he said, yep. and he was challenged by uh, Julian Simon. Yep. Could you tell us about what, what the bet was that they made? Sure, this is the, this is the now famous Simon Ehrlich wager. Uh, and. Uh, uh, at the time it was made, in the, uh, in the late 70s, there was enormous concerns about resource scarcity. Um, Jimmy Carter had announced that resource scarcity and energy scarcity was the greatest challenge facing the United States. There were predictions that the huge population growth that, that everyone could see occurring at that time would lead to widespread famines around the world, that we would be running out of food, we'd be running out of resources. There were some very popular bombshell books um, uh, that, that, that predicted that the population explosion that was occurring at that time uh, would lead to ruin um, for the global population. And, uh, and an economist, uh, J Julian Simon, predicted the opposite. He said, you know, no, as, as time goes by, um, things are actually going to become more abundant and cheaper. And so these, these, these two people entered into a bet uh, around whether or not over the course of the 1980s that five metals that they selected together would go up or down in price. And to cut a long story short, uh, the result was that all five metals went down in price over the course of that decade. And uh, the man that won the bet, Simon, uh, his, his theory was, in a sense, at least over that period, vindicated. And his theory was, over time, technology enables us to switch out of scarce materials and find new materials, to use less materials in some of our applications. So for example, you know, we used to use a lot of steel in household appliances. As steel becomes more expensive, we switch to plastics. We used to use a lot of copper in telecommunications. Uh, as copper becomes expensive, we switch into other materials like fiber optics. So technology offers us the opportunity to uh, at least to some extent across some different commodities, and it is different across different commodities, uh, to continue the path of human progress uh, and, and avoid these scarcity issues. You know, and, and indeed, you know, over, the last, over the last 50 years or so, until recently, we saw you know, a, a, re, a relatively steady period of commodity prices, with commodities being relatively abundant around the world. And we're currently going through a period of heightened commodity prices. Uh, and so this, this debate is reigniting right now. It's a very optimistic view that we can just continue to, to pull more uh, resources, commodities out of the ground. Surely, yeah. may, maybe uh, Paul Ehrlich just got his dates wrong. He, he may well have just got his dates wrong, but you know, the, the, the underlying theory that he brings to the table, uh, I think, is powerful. Uh, and, and I think you know, another market where we're seeing this is in, is in the oil market. Almost since oil was discovered, people have been predicting its end. The, yeah. the peak oil theory has been around for for, for 60 years, and it never is, you know, uh, oil is not ending, and we've just made massive discoveries of, uh, of new uh, coal seam gas, which are going to provide uh, uh, another enormous reserve of, 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 of hydrocarbon based energy. Um, so, you know, as time goes by, we develop better technologies in extraction, better technologies in discovery, better technologies in refining. Uh, and we seem to be able to continue to use more and more hydrocarbons as time goes by. So I think you know, technology is a, is a tool that enables us to do more with less as time goes by. And the, the challenge of that is that, uh, you know, to, to quote, um, to quote uh, President Obama's uh, energy secretary, you know, there, are, there are enough hydrocarbons to keep us going, but there are also enough to really cook us. So the challenge for technology is to take it is, is, is to take the, all the skills that we've, that, we've, that we've previously applied to developing more energy sources, more hydrocarbon sources, and apply that to renewable technology. 
I'd like to also apply these ideas to the production of food because obviously with a, a growing population, a rapidly growing population, mm -hmm. uh, these issues really hit home. You know, it's, it's, these are life and death matters when it comes to the, the global industrial production of food or, or not industrial production of food. Mm -hmm. You make the point in your essay that there's been incredible uh, rises in efficiency in the production of food over uh, the last 50 years, in particular the Green Revolution, etc. Uh, but these are very much based on uh, fossil fuel and phosphate developments. Mm. Uh, do you see this, can we continue with the trajectory that we've been on? Yeah, I mean the, um, the global population has been growing extremely rapidly. Um, to, to give you a sense of how rapidly the, the, the the chronology is really extraordinary. You know, it took it took ten thousand years for the, to get a billion people on the planet, from the birth of civilization to around eighteen hundred. The second billion then took just one hundred and twenty four years. The third billion took thirty three years. The fourth billion took fourteen years. The fifth billion took thirteen years, and we're now adding a billion people to the planet every twelve years. So. The rate of population growth is truly extraordinary. And we've recently clipped over 7 billion, and by 2050, we're going to 9.5 billion. So another 30% on top of where we are now. That's like adding two Indias to the global population. Uh, and at the same time, uh, as, we, as we have to add 30%, as we will add 30% of, peop of people to the global population, all of the existing people are consuming more. So as the developing countries rightly, as the developing countries rightly develop, they're consuming more food and also higher quality food, which requires more resources in and of itself, particularly meat and dairy. So you know, uh, experts in this area estimate that we'll have to double the world's food production by 2050 to accommodate that increase in population and the increase in appetites from poor people around the world. So that is an extraordinary global environmental and economic challenge. Uh, and I think you know, you know, we, we need huge changes in our system of agriculture in order to accommodate that. The things that have made food production so efficient over the past few years have been things like phosphates, but that's not a renewable resource. So in some way, in some people are arguing that we're actually running out of phosphates. To reference our previous discussion, I'm sure it's a point of uh, conjecture as well, but arguably there's, without phosphates there's no way that, that we could cater for this kind of rising population. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think we've clearly had a number of tailwinds, um, including fossil fuels and you know, a, a range of different uh, 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 fertiliser options, and those are going to change. You know, we, we need to use less fossil fuels across the board, including in agriculture. Um, but you know, again, we, we faced these kind of challenges before. In, in the essay, I talk about um, uh, a period a century ago when agriculture benefited enormously from a particular kind of fertilizer that came from South America called guano. And it led to a huge boon in European agriculture as this guano was mined and, uh, and, and brought to Europe to fertilize European fields. And then it ran out. Uh, and there was you know, nearly a crisis in Europe as they ran out of this extraordinary fertilizer. Um, but they discovered an alternative kind of fertilizer. You know, the harbour process was enabled them to, to, uh, to access nitrogen from the air uh, and create an alternative source of, of fertilizer. And so technological progress took over as a resource was exhausted. Now, you can't guarantee that's always going to happen. Um, uh, uh, and we do need to be very mindful of, of limited resources. There's no question about that. But technological progress is an avenue that we can continue to to, to seek to make gains in, and that will be enormously helpful. I heard an Indian environmentalist, in fact, the two Indian environmentalists I've heard speaking publicly both said, to be an environmentalist in India, uh, the most important thing is, is actually the education of women, because the education yeah. of women is what reduces fertility rates, etc. It seems to me that without reducing global population growth, there's uh, that at some point you'll have to bump up to the limits of uh, resources, even water, I think. 
yeah. is, a, is, is, a, you know, is a finite resource. Yeah. I just wanted to bring it back to uh, the, the climate change issue. Again, we come up with this very difficult conundrum of reducing emissions while we have a, a growing population resources use. Geoengineering seems to me the, the, the great elephant in the room. It d doesn't really seem to have been discussed so much mm. publicly. Do you think this is something that will uh, come to the fore more? Y yes, I do. I mean, so you know, ge geoengineering is, uh, people talk about it as a backup plan for climate change, uh, a mechanism to alter the Earth's climate um, to try and offset some of the impacts of, of global warming. And there are, a, there are a number of different proposals for how you might do that. Um, I, I, think, I think a lot of people, for understandable reasons, are, are concerned about geoengineering. Uh, the research is uh, currently quite weak. The risks are extremely high. And I think you know, people are genuinely worried that you know, geoengineering might be thought of as an excuse not to make progress on reducing emissions. Uh, and, th and those are all legitimate concerns. You know, but uh, unfortunately, I think that the situation that we're in now with climate change is such that it is extremely grave and extremely unpredictable. You know, we, could, we, could, we could end up, we, you know, we may or we may not, but there is a possibility that we could end up with very serious non-linearities in our climate change impacts, where we suddenly have to deal with a very rapid warming, uh, which is extremely challenging to adapt to. Uh, and if we end up in that world, in a slightly unpredictable world, if something happens that we, that we don't expect, then you know, we will need to look at geoengineering solutions. So uh, I hope that we make progress on that as a backstop technology. And I hope that we don't use that, however, as an excuse not to take action on emissions reduction. But I think we need to do both. It's been great to talk to you. Thanks yeah. very much. Thanks very much, Nick.